Thank you, Your Honors. We were talking before the break about General Perisic's ability to discipline and punish his subordinates. I'd like to turn. Yeah, I just wanted to find out. Yes. Is there any other person? You said you didn't know whether this particular person was punished. Is there any other person that was ever punished? Yes, I'm about to address four oh, of them, okay. Your Honor. Your Honor, there is, uh, I'm going to address the situation of the four SVK generals, Generals Chelikedich, Novakovich, Murkovich, and Bolyanovich. Now, they were viewed by General Parasich as being responsible for the defeat of the SVK. And General Parasich had a problem, however, because of their high profile uh, he had the authority, of course, to institute disciplinary proceedings against them, but he took a more cautious approach. He consulted with the SDC. If we turn to Prosecution Exhibit 2203, we can see the text of the Collegium of the Chief of the VJ General Staff from the 6th of November, 1995, and this is General Perisic. And this is his approach to the SDC. He says, as I wrote to the Supreme Defense Council that all four of them should be prosecuted, quote, is it in your interest that they would be prosecuted? They said, yes. And is it in your interest that that would not be made public? Yes. And now if we pension them off and then prosecute them, there are different sanctions than if we do not pension them off and prosecute them. And they said, as it was necessary to calm things down and not to make public, then they made a Solomonic decision to pension off all four of them, and they pensioned them off. Now. We know from the evidence that the this, this SDC uh, this collegium text is the sixth of November, 1995. We know that those four generals served in the SVK, I think, until October of 1995. <coughs> but based on a decision that was taken by the SDC. They were retroactively retired to the 31st of December, 1994. Now, Your Honor, uh, we assert that that was punishment of those four generals for their conduct while they were serving as VJ members in the SVK. They were covert punishments. Because as the SDC said, they didn't want to make these public. There were tangible effects of that punishment, and beside the, the loss of prestige, these four generals were entitled to pension benefits through the full period of their active military service, which was in October of 1995. They were deprived of those benefits because the pension benefits only went up to the 31st of December, 1994. Now, Your Honors, the SDC's fears about public trials were justified. Uh, it would have exposed the truth about the personnel centers. It would have exposed what, a trial would have exposed what the personnel centers were in fact. It would have revealed the way logistics were supplied to the personnel centers. In short, your honors, it would have exposed the deception of the personnel centers. And I just refer your honors to uh, paragraphs 753 and 754 of our brief. Thank you. Your Honor.
like yeah. you had a question to ask me. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say, given just that uh, scenario that you have painted, yes. what would you then say was the effect of this requirement to keep things under the carpet on the material ability to punish the subordinate by the accused? Take it had any, uh, what, what I think, Your Honor, is they were punished, period. Whether it was covert or not covert, General Perisic had the authority, and at the direction of the SDC, he could get rid of people, whether there were public trials, public disciplinary proceedings, and the like. As he said in the 14th session, we'll find another way to get rid of them. In this situation, this is a covert punishment of these four generals. So while General Perisic had fully the capacity and the authority over VJ members to institute disciplinary proceedings. The way those disciplinary measures were implemented against people were either overt, in some sense, or covert. So I don't think it had, you know, I, I think, frankly, that's the way the situation was. That's the way General Perisic received his directions from the SDC, his and that's the way uh, people were punished. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually thinking in particular uh, punishment for the crimes alleged in the indictment. Not only these four, but everybody that the prosecution alleges should have been punished. I think General Perisic had a duty and a responsibility as a commanding officer to institute proceedings against people he knew had committed crimes. Uh, the political environment doesn't relieve him in any way of that responsibility. He had the responsibility to take measures, which he failed to take. He had the capacity. He exercised the capacity. He just didn't do it in respect of war crimes. But, but you, from what you have, you have been saying this morning, it looks like the political environment, which you say it, it should not be taken into account, was the very political environment that constrained him in, 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 in punishing people. Your Honor, we, we have no evidence before this chamber that General Perisic was relieved of his responsibilities as a commander at the direction of his sub political superiors. He had an obligation, regardless of the political climate, to discharge his responsibilities. He could not, he could not rely on the climate, if you will, to discharge his responsibilities. He could have done a number of things. He could have taken ameliorative steps when he knew there were war crimes being committed. He could have issued orders, commands, directions. He could have brought people in, consulted with his people. He could have even resigned if there was a direction to not proceed. He did none of those. In fact, Your Honor, as I'll discuss later, he assisted war criminals avoiding justice. Thank you. I'd like to turn next to the cases of Mr. Atic and Mr. Vujic. Those two cases are described in our brief in paragraph 741 through 746. These were both members of the 30th Personnel Center, the VRS. Both these individuals went AWOL from the VRS. Both these individuals were prosecuted in a VRS military disciplinary court. And in the case of Antic and Vujic, their sentence was the loss of status as an active duty serviceman. The VRS forwarded those judgments to the VJ and ask the VJ to take further action. 
It was up to the VJ then, Your Honors, to decide what to do about its personnel who had committed disciplinary measures in the VRS. And in these cases, Your Honor, they took different actions. In the Antich case, they considered the matter and they discharged him from the VJ. In the Vujic case, they came to a different conclusion. They kept Mr. Vujic, uh, they didn't terminate his service. Mr. Vujic continued to serve in the VJ until 2005. So ultimately, Your Honor, the decision maker was the VJ on the offenses that had been committed in the VRS. Now, Your Honor, uh, let me turn to the other, another issue of uh, determinations, which is another indicator of effective control. Perisic, General Perisic had the authority to terminate members of the VJ who were serving in the personnels, and he did so. I have described, or we have described in our brief uh, in paragraph 761, a number of such incidents, but I will like to show you Prosecution Exhibit 1904, which is a VJ order issued by General Perisic. Uh, it is in relation to Lubisha Bayara. Mr. Bayara was convicted in this court of genocide. Uh, and it is dated the 6th of August, 1997. And you can see that pursuant to General Perisic's order, Mr. Bayara is terminated from the VJ. Now, he also exercised that authority when it came to members of the SVK. If we could turn to Prosecution Exhibit 1684, you'll see in this case, Your Honor, this is the case of uh, an individual by the name of Bora Poznanovich. And Mr. Poznanovich was serving in the, he had served in the 40th Personnel Center as the 7th SVK 7th Corps Commander. Now, he was retired from the VJ three years after the debacle in Croatia. He was retired on the 30th of June, 1998, by General Perisic. The next issue, Your Honor, another indicator of effective control. These two, I see the reasons for these two people given is that they've had 40 years of pensionable service. Yes, that's correct, and that was, that's under Article 107 of the law in the VJ. There are a number of criteria in which, by which you can, someone can be terminated from service. Uh, what's interesting, frankly, about 40 years or 30 years of effective service, within that framework, there was the opportunity for General Perisic to discipline people who didn't follow his orders. And he says so in one of the SDC sessions. He says, we can find another way to get rid of them. You know, we can say they've met their pensionable service years. So yes, they relied on that law, that provision of the law, but they relied on that provision of the law also to covertly sanction members of the personnel centers who had committed disciplinary infractions and the like. I guess then my question would be, these two, had they also committed some infractions? General, we uh, assert in our indictment that uh, Colonel Bayara was one of the persons responsible for the massacres committed in Srebrenica. Sure, no, no, I understand that, but what I'm saying is, although the ostensible reason is 40 years pensionable service, was in fact the authentic reason, the fact that they were being punished. I can't say that, Your Honor. I kind of doubt it myself. I think that probably the reason was, was that he had completed 40 years of service. Sure. However, what's interesting to note about this retirement in termination on the 30th of June, I'm sorry, 
Let me get the right date on Mr. Bayara. On the 6th of August, 1997, is it's uh, two years after the crimes that were committed in Srebrenica, two years after General Perisic knew about what happened in Srebrenica and had time to investigate and inquire about what happened in Srebrenica. He could have terminated Colonel Bayara much sooner than two years after the crimes. Thank you, Mr. Now, Your Honor, I'd like to turn to another issue that's raised in the defense brief, and that deals with General Jordi Jukic's evidence. General Jukic, for your information, was a member of the 30th Personnel Center. He was on the VRS main staff. He was in charge of logistics. We have asserted, Your Honor, that VJ officers who were serving in the personnel centers retain their VJ identification cards. The defense takes a contrary position. They assert in paragraph 220 of their brief that the prosecution failed to prove that officers who were serving in the VRS were given VJ identity cards. Secondly, they assert that the VJ did not issue military identity cards to officers serving in the VRS during the conflict period. That Jukic's evidence that he possessed a VJ identity card has not been corroborated and cannot be relied on. And that this failure of proof demonstrates the existence of three separate independent and autonomous armies. If we could have Prosecution Exhibit 1653 on the stand, this General Jukic had two identity cards when he was arrested. He had this card, which was issued in Han Piesic. It's a VRS card. And if we could turn to the next element, this is General Jukic's VJ identity card. Uh, that was issued to him on the 25th of January, 1995. Uh, and you'll see the translation of what is on the cover in Cyrillic on the lower left-hand side of this image is Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, Yugoslav Army, Military Identity Card. So you must judge, Your Honors, you've heard testimony from defense witnesses who said they didn't receive a VJ identity card. I ask you to consider their evidence in light of the evidence that General Zhukic had received the VJ identity card. Now, Your Honor, let's take a look, if we can, at what General Perisic has to say whether VJ personnel were serving in the VRS and the SVK. I'm going to play a portion of a film for your honors, and it has script underneath it. Please. Just a moment, Your Honor. I want to just check something. You do have it.
that I wanted played. I will read the text of Prosecution Exhibit 2879, uh, unless you have it. Okay. Your Honor, let me read the text. And this is, Your Honor, is found in P2879. The timer number is 1 colon 01 colon 35 to 01 colon 02 colon 23. This is A film, Your Honor, that is relevant. Did, did that come up on your honor's screens? We have, we have a transcript on our screens. Okay, this isn't very successful, your honor. Let me try reading the text then into the record. I have given your honors the uh, citation. Let me read this to you. Almost no decision in the Republic of Serbia and Kraina, although it had its political leadership, nor in Republika Srpska, was made without an agreement of the state leadership of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia at the time. Analogously, the army also had close time, and there were several reasons for that. Firstly, because it was one single army. Secondly, because it had its members in all those areas. And thirdly, because it had equipment which was getting its logistics support mostly from the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. If your honors go to the actual film, you'll, which is P2879, there's a text that's underscored. Now, your honors, I want to turn to a slightly different element, but related. And that is the issue of General Perisic's material ability to punish the criminal conduct of his subordinates serving in the personnel centers. We assert that it was concurrent with the material ability of Karadic, Martic, and commanders of the VRS and the SVK. The defense takes a number of positions on this account. It Paragraph 155 of the defense brief, the defense says that the prosecutor's office is articulating a novel theory that is both legally and factually unfounded. The principal position of the defense, which is repeated throughout their brief, paragraphs 154, 857, and 858, is that the principle of unity of command excludes the existence of any superior position being held by someone who is outside the chain of command. And what they assert is that upon receiving their assignment on duty in the VRS, personnel center members entered 
the exclusive and sole chain of command of the VRS with Karadich as the supreme commander in the VRS. As such, and in accordance with the principle of unity of command, both Perisic, Perisic both legally and practically could not exercise control over members of the VRS who were regulated via the 30th Personnel Center. It's our position, Your Honor, that the defense confuses two concepts, the principle of unity of command and the concept of effective control. They're separate and distinct principles. In respect of whether the position is legally unfounded, I draw Your Honor's attention to the case, the Popovich judgment, paragraph 2025, where the court stated as follows. It's necessary to distinguish the military concept of the singleness of command from the assessment of effective control for the proper functioning of an army, there can only be one individual in command of any particular unit at one time. However, the test for the superior subordinate relationship rests on the ability to effective control. There is no, I'm sorry, let me, let me read that again, I misread it. However, as the test for the superior subordinate relationship rests on the ability to effectively control as opposed to the exercise of that control, there is no exclusivity to a determination of effective control. In the next paragraph, Your Honor, paragraph 2026, the court goes on to say, in addition, giving the purpose of the law relating to superior responsibility, a superior cannot rely on a principle of singleness of command described to ensure army efficiency in order to escape responsibilities which relate to the suppression of the gravest of crimes. So it's our submission, Your Honor, that in respect of the jurisprudence of this tribunal, uh, it is in, there is a legal recognition of the prosecution's theory. Second of all, I'd like to assert, Your Honor, and, uh, and I will have to go into closed session, that there in fact existed a parallel chain of command between General Perisic and the SVK. If we could go into closed session for just a moment. May the Chamber please move into closed session. You want closed session, not private, private session. Is fine, Your oh, Honor. Private, private, I have no private, I'm sorry. Private session. We're back in open session. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Hahn. Your Honor, it's our submission that the o that we have established through the evidence that there was, in fact, a parallel chain of command between General Perisic and the SVK. Uh, the command, the parallel chain of command went like this. In the SVK, and using General Mertzich as an example. In the SVK, the Supreme Commander was Martich. And the head of the SVK, the commander of the main staff, was Mertzich. So there was a line of command that went from Martich to Mertzich to the subordinates. We also say that the parallel chain of command went from Perisic to Mertzich, who was a member of the 40th Personnel Center. The evidence shows the following, Your Honor. As I mentioned, Mertzich was the RSK Supreme Commander. Immediately, immediately before Mertzich became chief of the, of the SVK main staff, he was a VJ officer. That is, he was the assistant chief of the VJ general staff for the land army. He assumed his duty in 
as SVK commander on the 17th of May, 1995, pursuant to a decision in the SVK. We could go into closed session, Your Honor. May the chamber please move into closed session? I assume you want private session, actually, Mr. I do, Your Honor. I'm sorry. Open session, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, we've seen. Yes, Mr. Palmer. Your Honor, we've seen some of these documents. They are commands. If we could go to uh, P2412, Your Honor, this is the command that we saw earlier today. A command issued by General Perisic to Slobodan Perich. Uh, and just pull it up. So this, this is his corroboration, Your Honor, that General Perisic was issuing commands to personnel in the SVK. This is the 20th of June, 1995, about five weeks after Merksic had become commander of the SVK. We go to P-177, Your Honor, we've seen this document also. Just for the record, this is, I see on the monitor here, it's P-1777, not 77. No, it's, if I said 77, I made a mistake. Well, you said 177. I, I, I seem to recall I made that mistake as well in the trial, so I don't, I'm sorry. 1777, Your Honor. Right. And I still see that the, thank you so much. You can see, Your Honor, this is a, an order, an order, a naredba, that was issued on the 16th of September, 1995, to uh, General Merksic who was the commander of the SVK and had been the commander of the SVK since the 17th of May, 1995. Additional corroboration, Your Honor, is found in P1925, which is uh, interesting because this is a command that was issued to the SVK before. General Merksic became commander of the SVK. It was issued on the 24th of March, 1995. Now, finally, if we could turn to Prosecution Exhibit 1340. This is an intercepted communication between Slobodan Milosevic and General Perisic. The relevant text for this part of the submissions, Your Honor, if we could have that up, is Slobodan Milosevic, and he's making a request to Perisic. Request contact with Merksic only, and he should not take any orders from Martic. General Perisic's response is quite revealing. He hasn't been taking any for a long time. Finally, Your Honors, to corroborate uh, the testimony we've been talking about, there is Mr. Borovich's evidence. Mr. Borovich was a defense witness who was the chef de cabinet of the VJ general staff, who testified that General Perisic toured the units of the SVK 11th Corps in the fall of 1995. That testimony is found at 14,092. Now, it's our submission, Your Honor, that the principle of unity of command is not a bar to General Perisic having effective control over the personnel center members. The facts of the case are in our submission demonstrate that General Perisic did have effective control over VJ members serving in the personnel centers. He had the material ability to prevent them from committing crimes and punishing them. He was concurrent with the material ability of the commanders of the VRS or the SVK. Now, let me just add, Your Honors, 
the failure of the VRS and the SVK to exercise their material ability to punish the perpetrators of crimes of VJ members who committed crimes in Croatia and in Bosnia does not relieve General Perisic of his responsibility to punish his subordinates. Otherwise, you'd have a gross loophole in the law. A commander could send his troops into a different state. They could commit crimes. The receiving state would not punish them. And is that an excuse for General Perisic or the commander who has effective control from the sending state to do nothing? It's our submission. It is not. In fact, it would undercut the protective measures offered by international law. General Perisic was obliged, Your Honor, to take action against his subordinates. If he knew they had committed crimes while they were serving in Croatia and in Bosnia. Hence my question yesterday about resubordination. Your Honor, ask, ask me your question again. I'm, prepared. I'm, 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 not asking, I'm not asking it again, but I just say, hence my question yesterday. Your Honor, I, I, let me find your question from yesterday because I have my transcript here. If you want to know, if you want to address that, the question of simply whether by going over to the other army, is this not a resubordination? Well, we, I, I do recall, Your Honor, we had a discussion on the terms because there's resubordination, there's subordination, and we didn't want to get hung up by the lexicon. No. So subordination lexicon. is where you are. What? We're saying that these people, as I said, Your Honor, were VJ personnel serving in Bosnia and in Croatia, and as such, Perisic had effective control over them and had the responsibility to deal with their disciplinary measures, notwithstanding the fact that operational control may have been in the situation of the, of the armies for a while. The operational control may have existed in the VRS and the SVK. So we say, yes, he did have a responsibility, notwithstanding the, the whatever we call it, the transfer, the service in those countries. That concludes, Your Honor, my remarks in respect of uh, 7-3. I have some remarks in respect of sentencing. If you'd like me to make them now, I'm happy to do so. You are in control. Yes, Your Honor, I'd be happy to do it. Your Honor, uh, we have briefed the sentencing considerations in our brief. I said we weren't going to repeat the sentencing, the brief in its entirety, but I want to touch on some points. The primary consideration in sentencing and in determining a sentence is the gravity of the crime. Uh, in making that assessment, there are two elements that the court has to consider. The seriousness of the underlying crimes and the form and degree of participation of General Perisic. Now, the seriousness of the underlying crimes, the Sarajevo cases, have been litigated twice. The Zagreb missile attack has been litigated before this institution. Srebrenica has been litigated four or five times before this institution. Courts in this institution have found those crimes to be serious. I don't intend to expand or make any additional comments on the seriousness of those crimes, Your Honor. Decisions in this court have spoken for themselves. The facts speak for themselves. I'd like to turn to the form and the degree of participation of the accused, which in this case, Your Honor, is somewhat detached, if you will. General Perisic never fired a bullet he never personally killed anyone. He never 
personally set fire to a house in Bosnia or in Croatia. He never personally drove a non-Serb from his home. The conduct in which he participated is criminal conduct by virtue of those facts may seem less repugnant to us, much, much less repugnant to our sensibilities. That, I understand, is most always the case. We have a reaction to people who we see who are the hands-on killers, the people who have blood on their hands, uh, the people who terrorize people force them to leave from their homes, destroy their cultural sites and their monuments. Uh, physical distance, however, Your Honor, from the actual crimes or lack of hands-on involvement of those crimes is, is certainly less jarring. It's natural to our sensibilities. General Perisic is charged with aiding and abetting the people who did all of those things who killed people, who forcibly displaced people, who ran a, snap, a sniping and shelling campaign in our submission, Your Honor, given the protracted nature of the crimes and the magnitude of the crimes. That form of participation should not lessen his responsibility. His assistance to the VRS endured throughout his tenure as chief of the general staff. And it was during that period of time some of the most significant crimes occurred. Now, another consideration, and I touched on it earlier, that your honors should consider, is that General Perisic harbored General Mladic. General Mladic is one of the only two remaining indictees uh, who has not been arrested. I, we submit, Your Honor, that, that those acts are relevant to your consideration when deciding what sentence to impose. Now, the defense brief sets forth a number of mitigating factors. Uh, let me just say his cooperation with the Office of the Prosecutor. He did agree to sit down and have a meeting with the prosecutor. There was a succession of interviews with us. However, General Perisic was not entirely forthright. And it's our submission that that cooperation should attract no weight in mitigation. General Perisic voluntarily surrendered. The tribunal has given consideration to that. I'm fully aware of that. It's our submission, however, that measured against the magnitude of the crimes that we're considering in this case, that voluntary surrender should also attract little weight. Now, we heard through the trial uh, a number of uh, witnesses who testified about General Perisic's opposition to Slobodan Milosevic. Let's be perfectly clear. During the period through the war, General Perisic was not in opposition to Slobodan Milosevic, the two of them were two of the most important people in the assistance that was given to the VRS and the SVK. Moreover, the opposition to Slobodan Milosevic, which is at the end of his tenure, uh, and we heard testimony about the Kosovo War. General Perisic was not opposed to using the army in Kosovo had there been a declaration of war, but there wasn't. And under those circumstances, he was opposed. He wasn't opposed to the war, however. It's our submission, Your Honor, that his opposition to Milosevic at the end of his tenure should have no weight 
in terms of mitigating these enormous a sentence for these enormous crimes. Your Honor, it is our request 